A secret island inside of a coronal hole has given us a big solar storm. And hold on to your hats, because we have a lot of new activity rotating into Earth view. Those stories and more are in this week's Spotlight. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is picking up in a big way. We've had a lot of activity both on the west limb and the east limb. You can see region 4207 firing like that. We also have big filament launches right there. There's also a massive filament launch here right about midday on the 12th. Look at that massive eruption. That was a gorgeous one. We also have a near fi uh, firing right here with a small eruption going off like this. So we've had a ton of activity, but we just haven't had anything that's Earth directed. You can see we also have a lot of stuff that are rotating into the uh, Earth view from the far side. You could see this eruption here. We also have a filament that launches here in just a second. On top of that, we've got region 4216 and region 4217. They are both becoming big flare players. So expect to see a lot of activity from them this week. We also, of course, have had a big solar storm, but none of the stuff that I've talked about is really the source of it. That the source of the big solar storm is due to this coronal hole right here, which is a really noteworthy coronal hole for a number of reasons. As you'll see, when it rotated to about center disk, a lot of people were looking at it and saying, oh, it looks kind of like Tasmania or you know, maybe a butterfly. But it also, as it rotated to the west limb, it looked maybe like a heart. It kind of changed a little bit or possibly a bird. But that's not the big story. Really, when we look at this, we typically think that these coronal holes, well, it's just the angle by, by which you view them that changes their shape. And that's what I had thought originally. But then we had a big solar storm from the fast solar wind from this coronal hole, which was not expected. This coronal hole has a polarity that right now is not supposed to give us of big storms or big aurora. So I decided to take a closer look and that maybe this isn't just projection effects. Maybe there's something really changing. So as we end up taking a closer look at this structure with the magnetic polarity, you're looking at a composite view of the sun with HMI, which is basically our magnetic imager, as well as an overlay of a, a, ver a image of the sun that actually shows you where those coronal hole boundaries are. This is 211 angstrom if you're interested. Anyway, as I put this in motion just a little bit, you can see that there's a lot of like little yellow looking ants. Do you see all the little dots? This is the polarity of the coronal hole. This is what we call a negative polarity. And you can see pretty much the whole coronal hole has that. But as it rotates through center disk, look at what begins to develop. Do you see all of this stuff in here? This is blue. This is actually the opposite polarity. So instead of having an entire coronal hole that's negative polarity, there was an island of blue, possibly a finger that kind of kind of tucked down in here and began to poke out in the middle. Well, this little pit of blue magnetic field orientation, that positive polarity, is what ended up giving us about six hours worth of really intense storming. So it tells us that even though we have polarities of coronal holes that are supposed to be indicative of whether or not something is going to be storm worthy or not, little things like this can really make a big difference and change a nothing burger into a G3 level solar storm. And you can even see that polarity island right here just a little bit. See how that finger kind of dips down? So that in the end, this really wasn't just a projection effect. The, the shape of that coronal hole really did change.
Now, as we get back to the Islam, what's going to be coming ahead for us is that Region 4216, this region is already becoming a big flare player. Region 4217 has also been involved. We'll see if it begins to grow. But we have multiple regions that have been launching solar storms on the sun's far side. And so you're going to be able to end up seeing big solar storms possibly launching, as well as big solar flares and radio blackouts coming here very soon over this next week. And now switching to our sun's far side, we're using Stereo A imagery again because Stereo A is actually looking at a decent part of the west limb of the sun. You can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun substantially from the side. And you can see region 4207 up here. You'll see it continue to be active. I also want you to keep your eye on this filament right here because you can see, watch it right there midday, boosh! That was the big filament eruption that caused that cute, huge and gorgeous eye candy we saw to the south. So it's part of this big, long filament structure, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the, the full sun maps. And meanwhile, here is region 4207. You can see it continuing to fire. It is actually firing big uh, solar storms right now, so we're going to keep our eye on it because it may actually survive its far side passage and still be giving us big solar storms in about two weeks. And now switching to our full sun map, I'll pause here because our full sun map is a bit more complicated than it normally is. We need three different spacecraft in order to complete a full picture of the sun. So taking a look at our orbit circle here, you can see here's Earth. This is where we're using SDO AIA imagery. You see that in red right here. That's the front side sun with the east and the west limbs outlined in yellow. Now we also have Stereo A, just like we had from the previous segment. Stereo A is looking at the west limb and a little bit behind the west limb of the sun. So we've got right now, we've got uh, the Stereo A imagery listed in green right here. It's kind of filling a gap. And the reason for that is because solar orbiter is no longer completely on the far side, on the opposite side of, as Earth. Stereo, or solar orbiter is kind of rotated off to the east limb here, so it can't quite see everything. And that's why uh, solar orbiter, it's in blue and it kind of covers the rest of the far side. So it's a little bit more complicated this week, but still we get a full view of the sun. This is probably going to go away here pretty soon, but at least for now we still can see what's going on, which is super important. And the reason for that is I want you to take a look, first of all, at these really long filaments that just keep going. You can even see it wrap around to this side here. And you can see it again here in stereo's view, stereo wrapping around to uh, SDO Im A AIA imagery all the way in here. It's almost as if these big long filaments are kind of like the inside of a of a corkscrew or a, a bottle cap. If you've ever taken a look at the threads and you just screw them on or even a jelly jar. If you take a look at how those threads kind of are nested long uh, spiral-like structures, and they just kind of nest inside one another. And we're going to be dealing with a lot of that type of filamentary uh, structures over the next probably six months to possibly a year before things kind of calm down. So expect filaments to continue to be a big part of the solar storm picture. Now, let me go ahead and put this map in motion, but what I want you to take a look at is what's going on on the east limb here on the far side. You can see a couple regions. This, These regions, as you recognize 4216 and 4217, that's because as I put this in motion, you're going to see this east limb, they're going to rotate into Earth view on that east limb. But watch over here, you'll start seeing more regions. So these are reasonably new, but you can see more regions beginning to grow. You'll also see a new region growing in this area as well. And new regions have a tendency to be very volatile. So that's that's what we're going to be dealing with. We've got just an absolute ton of regions that are growing. We also have a, a filament that, that, I think you see it right here, it actually launches right in here. I'm trying to remember, there it goes, right there. It's kind of hard to see on the full sun map, but that was a filament on the sun's far side, with another small one. So expect to continue seeing the little filaments come in, but also these big regions are literally going to be rotating into Earth view here over the next couple days. And so we plan to get a lot more radio blackouts and the possibility of big solar storms launch towards Earth. And since September ended up ending the Aurora drought for so many people all over the world, I thought I would do a Aurora highlight for the month of September, showing you some of the best shots, like this Aurora, Aurora Australis from the ISS. And we had some gorgeous Aurora in New Zealand. And we had beautiful Aurora in Tasmania. 
And gorgeous aurora was seen even in Melbourne, Australia, just in the suburban area. We also had beautiful aurora in Latvia. This is now in the Northern Hemisphere. And of course, gorgeous aurora in Sweden. We had beautiful aurora in Scotland, even though it was kind of peekaboo. And we had gorgeous aurora in Lossy Mouth, also in Scotland. We also had beautiful aurora in Ireland. And in England, there were multiple places in England that had gorgeous aurora. And we had beautiful aurora in Denmark. And it reaches far south as France. And as we go over the pond, we had gorgeous aurora on a flight from Ontario to London. And there was beautiful aurora from Ontario, Canada, during this recent solar storm. It was also seen in Maine, along with a bolide. And we had some beautiful aurora in New Hampshire. This was just during this G3 storm that we had just the other day. And gorgeous aurora was seen in New York. And it was seen in Michigan. We had coronas in Michigan. We also had beautiful uh, shows, monstrous curtains coming down in Wisconsin, and gorgeous aurora that reached as far south as Wyoming. Multiple places in Wyoming had beautiful pillars. It even reached as far south as Nebraska with tall pillars, and as far south as Oklahoma, and it even went as far south as Texas. And now switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, with the new moon being on the 21st. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some more aurora, well, the moon is on our side. So let's hope we get a solar storm launch soon. And now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are still dealing with the fast solar wind from that coronal hole that's been rotating through the Earth strike zone, but we're past that special magnetic island, so don't expect any more G3 levels. In fact, at high latitudes, NOAA's only expecting active conditions, but we do have up to about a 40% chance of a major storm, oh, but probably going to be waning down pretty quickly after that. And by about the 18th, things should be pretty quiet. We're going to have to wait for bigger solar storm launches in order to get a possible chance of that G3 again. So Aurora photographers just kind of hang in there. We'll get some more storming soon. And now at mid-latitudes, we're only expecting active conditions with maybe about a 10% chance of minor storm conditions. So you might see a little bit of substorm brightening here and there, but probably not too much. And then in about 24 hours, things should be back to unsettled conditions. Probably not going to get much more, even though the fast wind will still be waning. So Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, likely the show's over for you, at least for right now. And now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting in the mid-120s for solar flux right now, and that means we're still got decent radio propagation on Earth's day side. It's on the little bit on the low side, but not too bad. We are expecting minor noise on the bands over the next couple days, with about a 25% chance of radio blackouts at the R1 to R2 level. We also have about a 5% chance of X-class flares uh, at the R3 level radio blackout, and mo moderate noise will be picking up here over the next couple days, and that's because of all the new regions that are rotating into Earth view. We're also going to see that solar flux begin to rise, so don't be surprised if you start hearing a lot more noise on the bands over the course of this week and radio blackouts return, because it sure looks like they will. And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Everything is in the green right now as far as radiation storms are concerned. We have the D1 normal range at the moment. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. NOAA is giving us about a 1% chance of a radiation storm at an S1 to S2 level. I'm going to go ahead and bump that up to about a 5% chance here over the next few days. And that will likely continue to rise unless those regions on the east limb end up kind of petering out a little bit, which it doesn't look like they will do because they're really young and young regions have a tendency to be volatile. So even though we're all in the green at the moment, expect the chances for these radiation storms to rise here over this next week. So be sure to pay attention to those IKO advisories if you are a frequent flyer or if you are air crew or a high-risk passenger. 
So the space weather this week has been pretty exciting. We had a G3 level solar storm that managed to surprise a lot of us and it gave us a little bit of a lesson in space weather forecasting. But Aurora photographers were still in the fast solar wind right now and if you're at high latitudes you could get a bit of substorming so some brightening could uh, uh, give you some decent shows over the next couple days because that fast solar wind is really fast so those shows will be very bright. Now Aurora photographers at mid latitudes maybe about another 20 24 hours you might get some subtle brightening but likely nothing like what we saw with that G3 uh, during that magnetic island appearance. Now amateur radio operators and emergency responders well you are expected to have a bit more activity coming up the rest of this week. We are expecting those new regions rotating into Earth view to cause the noise on the dayside radio bands to really jump up. We also have the risk for radio blackouts coming again. So expect uh, the quiet times that you've had on the day side of Earth to kind of change here over this next week. And even the week after that, expect things to continue to be high because there's a lot of activity that's going to be rotating Earth side here over the next couple weeks. So just kind of grin and bear it and we'll get through it. And now you GPS users, well, you know, the same kind of thing for you. We're dealing with some fast solar wind on the night side and a little bit of aurora here and there, and that always makes uh, GPS reception a bit dicey. So expect that scintillation to cause you at least sporadic issues with reception here and there. And then, of course, next week, as we start getting those radio blackouts, expect the day side to get a little bit worse for you because that can also cause the same kind of issues. So overall, stay vigilant. And if you're a drone flyer, be sure to calibrate your magnetometer often while we're still in the geomagnetic storm. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.